And here we are at the second game in the franchise, the black sheep, if you will, Dark Souls 2. Before I begin analyzing the bosses, I feel obliged to mention that I do not like Dark Souls 2. I think adaptability was a massive mistake that causes already sloppy hitboxes to come even more into focus, the balance in the game is a complete mess, and the areas are some of the most frustrating in the series. With that said, there are still some pretty good boss encounters, but just as many, if not more, duds. Today, we're going to look at exactly why I think these bosses fail so often. I do feel obliged to mention that this is the second video in a series dissecting the boss design of FromSoft's games. If you want to watch the first video, the link is in the description. You don't necessarily have to in order to understand the boss analyses here, but I will occasionally reference bosses or concepts that I bring up in the first video. The grade that I will be giving bosses will not vary game to game within this series. A C-grade boss in Dark Souls 2 is at the same level to me as a C-grade boss in Dark Souls 1. There are bosses that I think are an average Dark Souls 2 boss that earn a D grade in this video because I think that's where they fall in the series as a whole. As always, this entire video is just full of my opinion. If for some reason, Dragon Rider is the most exhilarating fight you have had in this entire decade, more power to you, buddy. With that said, let us begin our journey through Drangleic. The Last Giant is the only first boss in the entire FromSoft catalog, with the exception of Gascoigne, depending on your definition of first boss in that game, with an introductory cutscene. It notices you, goes berserk, and charges. The cutscene bosses in this game all have this red, pulsating filter over them that I'm usually not a fan of. I feel it pulls away from any of the cinemagraphic choices that the designers made, but it actually works pretty well for The Last Giant. It feels like you're hearing its heartbeat as it wakes up from this long slumber and helps the boss make a pretty good cutscene impression. Unfortunately, The Last Giant's moveset is simple to a fault. It swipes down and it stomps. You'll be slapping his ankles the whole fight, which is where the struggles of adaptability end up rearing their head for the first time in most people's runs. The hitboxes on his stomps definitely feel stacked in the giant's favor, and it's never clear quite how far away you really need to be to avoid damage. He never stops attacks once they start, so the iffy hitboxes often means that playing optimally means you step back and watch him stomp aimlessly for a few moments before you return to biting his ankle. He is also one of the first bosses who boasts a second phase. Once the giant has taken enough damage, he rips his arm off to use as a weapon, then proceeds to stomp around more. The concept of this phase change is not bad, but a second phase should noticeably change the fight in some way, particularly with a transition as intense as the boss tearing off its arm. The second phase should either be an escalation of stakes, require a different strategy, or carry some emotional significance to the player. The giant's second phase does none of these, and so ends up feeling underwhelming. The giant also participates in an overall game design trope that I am not a personal fan of. Bosses who hold keys to random doors. This giant in particular holds the key to a human-sized door to access a staircase onto the roof of the building. Why? One, why is that door locked, and B, why does the last giant have the only key? It makes the last giant feel less like a natural obstacle the player encounters, and more like an enemy on a checklist to complete the game. Overall, I would give the last giant a D grade. It's not an insulting fight, but the underwhelming moveset and hollow second phase leave the encounter feeling forgettable, and frankly, not a great starting place for Dark Souls 2. The Pursuer, meanwhile, puts on a much stronger early game showing. If you're playing Scholar, you'll encounter him first in the forest, and if you're new to the game, you'll just as quickly die or run away if you're lucky. He doesn't spawn in again after your first encounter, which does a great job hyping up the boss fight. It sets up the enemy as a threat before adding the music and health bar, and it makes the fight carry some real weight. Before I get into his moveset, however, I should mention that you can use the crossbows in order to kill the pursuer instantly. I didn't use it because I need footage to ramble over, but it's not hard to execute if you know the setup. Dodge his charge, pull the lever, and the fight's over. 
I'm not sure what exactly this mechanic was supposed to add beyond a method to avoid playing the game. What earns the Pursuer the most points in my book is how much he encourages strafing and positioning to manage your stamina. With the high stamina cost of a roll in Dark Souls 2, this allows you to avoid damage and retaliate without using all of your stamina every time. You can move under the Pursuer's spin, step out of the way of his charge, it encourages engaging with his moveset beyond using invincibility frames, which, considering invincibility frames aren't great this early on in the game, is a really fun spin on Dark Souls combat. Though the moves themselves are nothing special on their own, the specificity and precision of his attacks makes him a satisfying enemy to master. It helps elevate what would be a standard knight fight into a solid early game tutorial boss. A lot of Dark Souls 2's early bosses don't feel like they're trying to teach anything to the player. The Pursuer is the only boss out of this early game who feels like a test of the player's fundamentals. In my mind, it earns a solid C grade, being a decent fight that doesn't quite stand out among the series' roster as a whole, but does manage to stand out among the early game. The Dragon Rider, meanwhile, is a boss by technicality. Even if he didn't throw himself off of his own arena, if you count correctly, there is a lot missing from this fight. He swings his halberd and he holds up his shield. There's no trick, no twist, just a bulky boy with an axe. There are mobs in the same area with more complexity in their movesets than him. Maybe the thought was for him to teach players to engage with the level prior in order to fight the Dragon Rider in a full arena. In that case, design him to be particularly dangerous at close range, or make sure he doesn't fling himself off the arena. That would really drive home the point of needing that arena to be raised. It gets a D grade, though. I want to say more about him, but what is there to say? He's forgettable. And back again with a vengeance, it's Ornstein without Smo. As much as I joke, the old Dragon Slayer is actually one of the better reused bosses in the series. He's in a smaller arena, so his longer dashes were removed and replaced with leaping thrust attacks. His lightning was also replaced with a dark magic burst that, again, focuses more on providing threat in the smaller arena rather than the ranged threat of the lightning. He's tougher to stagger than his golden variant, making him harder to rush down than he was in Dark Souls, which actually accommodates for the fact that it's a one-on-one -on -one rather than a two-on-one. -on -one. Despite how much every part of my brain says I should be disappointed in this reskin as a point of principle, I really like this fight. The moveset has changed enough for me that it doesn't feel like a carbon copy, and my one issue with the entire Ornstein Smo fight, namely this glitchy charge move, has been replaced with jumping lunges to close the distance that work well in Dark Souls 2's slower tempo. That said, Dark Souls 2 has some serious problems with its boss placement. The old Dragon Slayer is behind a dragon that you have to slay to gain access to the arena to defeat him to gain access to a PvP covenant to protect invaded players. There's not much to say on that because that sentence was absolute nonsense and someone needed to seriously think about where this boss was going to be used and the effect they wanted it to have on the player. He's a fun fight, but he doesn't make you feel anything beyond, oh, look, it's Ornstein again. Where's Pikachu? Overall, I think he does earn a B grade. He's a fun enough fight, and he makes for a decent early game challenge. And he's more enjoyable than you'd expect for a reskin. There's a ton of fun ideas happening with the Flexile Sentry, but the game does not choose to go all in on any one of them, which leads to a boss whose implementation feels like an afterthought comprised of a bunch of half-baked ideas. To start, each side of the sentry has its own moveset, and it will change which side is attacking based on where you are in relation to it. Now this is a really fun idea, but though each side wields different weapons, they feel effectively identical. They both swipe, and they both do jumping attacks with the same speed. He does have one fun attack where he bends backwards and stabs the club side with his swords, and attacks like that do provide some much needed uniqueness to each side, but it makes me imagine a boss where one half is ranged and the other is melee and it tries to spin and has disadvantages and advantages to being on each side. The flexile sentry just doesn't provide anything to really take this idea to the next level. 
The arena suffers from the same principle. It's a tight space with a single poleless cover, and as the fight progresses, the water level rises until movement is impossible. This is, again, a really fun concept. The small area keeps you engaged with the boss while the water creates a natural timer. Unfortunately, this does not play well with the boss's main gimmick, because it makes the flexile sentry feel too simple. After all, the boss is usually dead before the room floods, so it makes an interesting idea feel like something that was just put in to make an underdesigned boss a little more difficult. Aesthetically, this is one of my favorite fights. The blue and the design of the Flexile Sentry work super well, but the gameplay doesn't stand out even with two really fun ideas. It earns a C grade. Though I don't think it quite goes the distance, I still think it's a decent fight overall with some fun ideas that I wish the series would return to. And here we are. This is the first boss that completely missed the mark for me. The Rune Sentinels are the first gank fight players will encounter in Dark Souls 2, and they make a far worse impression of the mechanic than the Bell Gargoyles did. Individually, the Rune Sentinels aren't difficult enemies. When they're in a tight space, you just strafe to the right and all of their attacks go completely over your head every time. If you aren't next to them though, their attacks are faster, deal heavy damage, and have a ridiculously long range. When the battle begins, you're on a small platform with one Rune Sentinel. The other two don't start aggressive and will not become aggressive until you either drop down or the first one dies. This is probably the most interesting and best implemented idea in this whole fight. If you drop down to an open space, the other two become aggressive and you'll be fighting three bosses. The game wants to test your understanding of the Sentinel's basic moves in a tight space. Unfortunately, the tight space also fails to provide the real threats the Rune Sentinels have, as they were designed for wide open spaces. Attacks like this long hammer strike and their spinning attack are what makes them dangerous. Everything else, you just strafe, and so you don't learn how to fight the Rune Sentinels because you barely see half of its moveset, and the one-on-one -on -one then fails to educate or prepare the player for anything. With it failing to teach the player anything, the first Sentinel becomes an irritation to remove at the start of each attempt. Now they'll both eventually jump up onto the platform, but you will have a short time to fight the second before the third arrives. Once it does, the fight goes from a bit underwhelming to completely falling apart. Since they share the exact same AI, their move sets will overlap constantly. They cover distance fast enough with their spinning attack that finding a safe moment to attack one is entirely based on luck. Their jump attack has a messy hitbox which stops players from rolling into punish, and their spin attacks breaks pillars, which stops players from even using cover like Ornstein and Smo allowed. On top of that, they can just hide behind their shields if they haven't thrown them yet, which makes it even harder to rush them down. As I mentioned, they can throw away their shields, and once they do, it makes the fight far more pleasant, because at least the target you're going for can no longer become immune to taking damage. It doesn't, however, fix the myriad issues caused by their overlapping AIs. If you thought the Bell Gargoyles occasionally overlapped, or Ormstein and Smo left few windows, the Ruined Sentinels are coded to leave even less. I would give the Rune Sentinels the first F grade in this video. It isn't the worst of the worst in the series, and it is on the higher end of the tier, because for the most part, their movesets function, but I dread this fight every playthrough. When Dark Souls 2 took Ornstein, they gave him a new coat of paint, some new moves, and made him a one-on-one -on -one fight. It made the old Dragon Slayer feel different than the Ornstein and Small Boss fight in an attempt to justify the reskin. Belfry Gargoyles, is the Bell Gargoyles, but made worse in every conceivable way. The Bell Gargoyles have a simple core to their design. Their tail is an axe, and they wield an axe. This made all their attacks wide but easy to roll through to punish. There was never confusion as to what they were doing at any point in time. One would run on all fours towards you while the other breathed fire, giving you the opportunity to counterattack. Now, there were some flaws within this fight, but the Belfried Gargoyles decided to throw everything good away and put in more flaws. They now have spears, and they will do short pokes that aren't well telegraphed or easy to roll through. You remember that weird flying swinging attack? Now they'll fly into the air and poke down after you three or four times. This makes their attacks take longer, which increases the likelihood of attacks overlapping. From a visual standpoint, the model of these gargoyles look bad. 
Instead of the cohesive bell gargoyle design, the belfry gargoyles are completely made out of rock, lacking any of the character that the more bestial gargoyles have. It's a frustrating change, considering how they were willing to completely reuse Ornstein's exact model. Now, as a final cherry on top, they changed how the gargoyles run. Instead of the four-legged sprint that made the gargoyles feel animalistic and intimidating, the belfry gargoyles waddle towards you. Not only is this a silly looking animation that makes the worst models look even worse, but it moves slower. Combined with longer lasting attacks, their AIs now match so there won't be one specifically trying to breathe fire, and when they do the fire breath will be closer to you and stop more opportunities than the original bell gargoyles did, everything is just cutting off access to enemies you could otherwise attack. It earns a low F grade. If I don't have to do this fight, I won't do this fight. It is an aggravating reskin that misses everything successful about the fight it's ripping off. The first intended great soul in the run has one of the best presentations out of the early game bosses of Dark Souls 2. The Last Giant and Pursuer had intro cutscenes, but the rest of the area's bosses feel unmomentous. The Lost Sinner is a tough design to make feel significant, as she's just a decrepit woman locked in a cell, but the opening cutscene does a great job building tension. The bug crawling into her eye is unsettling without being too horrifying, and her putting out the lights is a really nice touch that gives the fight some much needed character. The Lost Sinner is one of a pretty large roster of sword-wielding knights in Dark Souls 2, but her atmosphere helps her stand out from the other, often samey crowd of knights. Her attacks are faster and come up at the player from a low stance. Bosses in these games are almost universally larger than the player, so it ends up a nice change of pace to see a boss who swipes up rather than swiping down. However, The Lost Sinner is also where I started feeling the real struggle with hitboxes on my first playthrough when I hadn't been leveling adaptability. The attacks come out fast and dodging is precise. She can't do much to you against a good shield, but it turns a boss who has pretty precise attacks into a frustrating exercise. Again, though, it's tough to ding a boss for something that I think is a failure of the game as a whole. Her moveset does do a great job of keeping the pressure on, but her jumping away after most attacks does get repetitive. It separates her from the player, yes, which avoids her becoming combo food like so many of the other night bosses, but it moves her so far away that it kills a lot of the momentum of the fight for me. In terms of the lights, it's a neat little mechanic. It changes the lock-on distance that the player can use, which means a lot more camera control is needed when she does her leap away. Turning on the lights, however, is more trouble than it's worth. You have to kill the belfry gargoyles and then bring a torch through waist-deep water, or use a flame butterfly, which is pretty rare this early on in the game, to light a couple sconces in the room from the outside. Though it's a neat concept, and I can understand not wanting the penalty to be too severe, the reward doesn't feel worth the effort. What I would have wanted to see are some dark exclusive attacks or after effects. Maybe if she's in the dark her sword leaves hollow or fire effects, and the light can break through those attacks. You can even include attacks where she tries to put out the light for a short amount of time, making the area dynamically shift and change based off where the lights are. Suddenly, fighting her in the dark is more of an interesting challenge than just having more range on your lock-on, and the light has a more dynamic effect than the problem is now gone. The Lost Sinner also needs to be noted for boasting a really cool New Game Plus cycle change. Many boss fights just have higher health, but Lost Sinner gains the ability to summon two pyromancers to join in the fight. They're easy to spot, they don't have much health, and they're always separate from the Lost Sinner since they rely entirely on ranged attacks. This is good gank design. The pyromancers aren't overwhelming, but they are enough of an impact that you have to change your strategy for a moment. Either get more defensive and consider the pyromancers' attacks, or leave the Lost Sinner for a moment and attack the pyromancers, but not for too long that the Lost Sinner finds you. That's some great work. Good job, Dark Souls 2. Solid design, right there. Overall, the Lost Sinner earns a B grade. She sets a decent bar, particularly for the Great Souls, but does still struggle to stick out past having above average fundamentals. Starting off the run to the second of the four Great Souls, we have the Skeleton Lords, another boss which definitely tries to shirk the usual formula of bosses. Though the fight begins as a triple boss fight, it doesn't suffer from the usual woes of gank bosses, namely because these bosses can be better equated to elite enemies. Frankly, I'm amazed we didn't see these skeletons later as random enemies considering how many bosses in this game do end up returning. 
each lord will die in just a few hits and will stagger from attacks from almost any weapon. The catch is, once a lord dies, they'll summon either a horde of skeletons, a selection of armored skeletons, or bone wheels. At that point, it's just a matter of kiting those smaller skeletons around the arena and taking shots to take them out as the opportunity arises. They do like to group up, but they're small enough enemies that it's less of a problem than the ruined sentinels, and any weapon that swings horizontally does huge work in this fight. The Bone Wheels are definitely the biggest threat out of the second wave of skeletons, even though they thankfully pale in comparison to their Dark Souls counterparts. Just chase them down and you'll be back to fighting a horde of skeletons in no time. Overall, though the skeleton lords aren't bad, the fight doesn't really work as a boss. The skeletons take a while to spawn, there's not much unique engagement from the player, and it's really just a matter of smashing your way through some mobs. The skeleton lords earn a D grade. Though there is some enjoyment to be had here, the gamble the skeleton lords took just feels like a group of mobs with a health bar, which doesn't quite do it for me. Strangely enough, there are actually two experimental skeleton bosses, and this one is even stranger to discuss. The Executioner's Chariot is a platforming challenge, followed by a combat section. Whereas Dark Souls had a pretty significant list of gimmick bosses, the Executioner's Chariot is the closest that Dark Souls 2 gets to any kind of puzzle boss. The first part of this fight should be painfully familiar to anyone who played Elden Ring's Hero Tombs. The Chariot runs in a circle, and it does a ridiculous amount of damage to anything in its way. Rolling is technically possible, but the hitbox will linger long enough that it's unrealistic to reliably dodge. There are groups of skeletons infinitely resurrected by necromancers, hiding in wall crannies. The necromancers need to die to stop the skeletons from spawning, and the wall crannies are where you need to hide to survive the chariot's next run. Once you run far enough, you'll pull a lever, dropping a gate that will cause the chariot to crash. These necromancers, however, are my main issue with this first phase. Though it makes sense they need the skeletons to resurrect to keep the tension on throughout the fight, the skeletons don't die when their necromancers do which means you have to run forward, kill a necromancer, and then be trapped in a cranny in the wall, mobbed by the skeletons that came back while you ran after the necromancer. This becomes even more frustrating once the fight actually begins, because all of the skeletons are still alive. Once that fight begins proper, the chariot shatters, and the two-headed skeletal horse joins the fight as the true boss. As an enemy, it's actually pretty engaging. It focuses on charge attacks, bucks backwards to get you off its back, and has a breath weapon to keep you at a distance. This design also stands out as particularly unique among the rest of Dark Souls 2's boss roster, which makes the fight even more memorable. I think the Chariot does earn a C grade. I like the first running section, and I think the fight at the end has the potential to be a satisfying conclusion, but the skeletons and necromancers, although necessary in concept, make the fight go from an interesting multi-phase encounter to a repetitive run killing the same enemies over and over and over again. I feel like if the skeletons died with their necromancer, the entire fight would get higher, probably a high B grade, or potentially even squeezing into A tier. <sighs> Look at this. Some someone designed this and thought it needed its own musical theme. They, someone designed an environmental interaction where you can drop poison on it using arrows, like anyone would need that. The, the covetous demon is barely a boss. It attacks slowly, and I don't mean this as slowly, I mean slowly, will miss half the time and has no health. It is a massive slug that flails around, completely unable to mount any kind of lasting threat. It does do a lot of damage if and when it hits, but it has no ability to finish it off because it allows you to heal with no problem at all. It also boasts what might be the most silly lore of any boss in a Souls game. The covetous demon was in love with Mytha and wanted to impress her, so he ate an absurd amount of food and she still didn't love him, because why would that work? And so he kept eating and then he became a demon. Now that's some prepare to cry lore right there. Fuck a dog protecting its master's grave. This man was rejected and ate too much. Demons are all connected in the Dark Souls world, with everything stemming from the flame of chaos. These twisted monsters of flesh and fire, and then you have a guy who just overate. He gets an F grade. He is a waste of a slot in the boss roster, and with that said, he is fun to make fun of, so that's great. Mytha is not the hardest boss in the game. 
In fact, she's pretty easy on a iterative playthroughs. But she holds the crown of being the only boss in the entire Souls series that I needed to look up how I was supposed to defeat. Let me start. In terms of moveset, Mitha isn't incredible, but has a passable set of attacks with a lot of creative character design happening. She'll use spear sweeps that she follows up with her tail, lunges across the arena that make her hard to avoid, and she shoots soul arrows from her severed head, which is just really fun. She also has this attack where she throws her head as a projectile, it explodes, and then she jumps after it, and I, I, just, I just like that a lot. Her unique design and the decent moveset do make her an alright encounter in a vacuum, though nothing sticks out as incredible, it's still pretty fun. The unique aspect of her fight, her primary gimmick, is her arena. It's filled with poison, and if she's in the poison, she heals. Now, here's where the problem comes in. The arena in this footage is not Mytha's real arena. This is Mytha's arena after you light a single metal windmill on fire. If you don't do this, her arena becomes filled with poison goo. This means that without burning this specific windmill, you must do the entire fight with fat rolls, a slowed movement speed, well poisoned in a game where poison is buffed significantly, well the boss is healing constantly. Mytho would be an average, maybe even an above average boss fight, but this environmental effect is so massive and so unintuitively hidden that it completely ruins everything the boss was trying to accomplish. It actually ends up having the opposite effect as Last Sinner. The Lost Sinner communicated clearly what the problem in the arena was and how you were supposed to solve it, but then didn't give you enough of a boost to make it worth the effort. Mytha gives no signal that the poison is something you can even change, but the difference in difficulty without doing it is so massive. Maybe if the poison didn't make you fat roll, or maybe if it was a slower poison condition, or maybe if she just didn't heal. Whatever it is, the boss fight as it stands is held back by its environmental interaction. I give Mytha a D grade, which is a shame because I usually love this kind of arena creativity. The Smelter Demon is the most Dark Souls boss in Dark Souls 2, and he ends up on the top of many players' favorite boss lists because of this. I'd like to lead off by mentioning that the area before this boss is the worst area in the base game, but I'm not going to count it against the boss here, I just needed everyone to know that. The Smelter Demon is a three-phase fight and boasts a pretty involved moveset. He's got thrusts, slams, combos, leaping attacks, area bursts, and he moves between them all very seamlessly. It's a satisfying collection of attacks to move through, and it manages to hit a great balance between being too aggressive and still keeping you on your toes. The second phase is where, in my mind, Dark Souls 2 introduces the best boss gimmick in the entire game. Smelter Demon starts to deal chip damage to anyone next to it as the fire in its torso intensifies. Now, I usually hate force damage in a boss fight, and everywhere else it appears in the series, I will call it out as bad, but Dark Souls 2 has life gems. If you keep consistently popping life gems, the damage over time does nothing to you. This is the only time in Dark Souls 2 that the game displays an awareness of the player's unique attributes and abilities. That's something I feel is missing from so many bosses in Dark Souls 2. The best bosses in any game use their abilities to interact with the player's abilities, pushing them to an absolute limit, and forcing them to change the basic way they engage with the game. That's why the deflection game of Sekiro works so well, and why bosses like the Belfry Gargoyles are so unfun. A good boss wants the player to grow in skill to use every tool at their disposal to beat it, whereas a bad boss will throw out attacks and expect the player to find some place that they can probably counter. The Smelter Demon's well-paced moveset times well with the roll speed of Dark Souls 2, and it combines with a mechanic that encourages the use of a consumable item that is easy to obtain in mass. That is good game design. That is good boss design. That's how you make something memorable. The third phase is just a continued escalation of tension. The demon lights its sword on fire. It makes sense in this world, it's visually clear and interesting, and it changes the nature of the fight by putting more importance on dodging the swings of the demon. Sure, it doesn't change the moveset, but you don't need to change the moveset. You just need to escalate tension, and the sword being on fire does exactly that. Smelter Demon is a great fight, and I think it earns a high A grade. 
For some players, a great fight is enough, but I personally like a bit more oomph in the bosses that I call cream of the crop. With that said, the Smelter Demon is the first high point that I always look forward to in a run of Dark Souls 2. Immediately following the Smelter Demon is another gank fight. The Old Iron King puts you against a Belrog-like creature, fighting alongside a tiny hole in the floor. Starting with design, the Old Iron King feels like a great old one. Though the cutscene is cinematography-wise uninteresting, as he just kind of shows up and roars at you, the design itself does a lot of heavy lifting. The Old Iron King looks great, feels unique bathing in the lava, and the lava-filled veins around his eyes do add some great flair to an otherwise flat design. In terms of mechanics, the Old Iron King forces any non-magic player to be reactionary, much like the Moonlight Butterfly. However, players interact with almost every single move the Old Iron King does, rather than needing to wait for an arbitrary window to unload damage. The Old Iron King smashes his fist down, the player gets to attack. If he casts a spell, his hand moves forward and the player gets to attack the arm. He breathes fire and moves his hands just into range to do so. The downside of this almost turn-based boss is that the Old Iron King takes a lot of time to reflect on the meaning of his existence while you hit his arm. Dark Souls 2 doesn't do quite as well animating the weight of blows, and the Old Iron King is one of the bosses who suffers the most from it. He'll slam his fist down and then wait to be hit, rather than recoiling from the force of the blow. It's a fun dance, yes, but there's a hint of silliness to the whole exchange. Unlike the silliness of Covetous Demon, though, I do think the Old Iron King has enough going on in terms of concept that the strange animations can be a little forgiven. Fighting a demon swing in lava is a tough concept to play out. What is less defendable is the second boss in this arena, that hole in the ground I mentioned. All of the Old Iron King's attacks send you flying backwards, and when you combine that with being surrounded by death zones, and particularly a small hole in the center of the arena, dying to the Old Iron King means that you'll usually die to gravity rather than any actual buildup of damage. With the attacks as simple as they are, and being able to position yourself around the hole, it doesn't completely ruin the fight, but it feels, frankly, unnecessary. I feel like removing the center of the hole and shrinking the arena, particularly this back area that makes it so easy to hide, would have improved the fight by keeping you face to face with the old Iron King to make him a constant threat, while removing the artificial difficulty added by the great hole in the middle of the floor. Overall, I do think the old Iron King gets a high C grade. The character design is definitely a highlight, and another unique take on the Moonlight Butterfly's gimmick gives it some points. But the frustrating hole in the ground and strange animations do keep it from getting any above average nods. After you fight your way through a ruined town filled with ghosts, basilisks, lion warriors, and cursed pots, you find a woman buried up to her waist in sand, throwing soul arrows at you. That's a really underwhelming boss introduction, and Najka just looks silly here. Once you land a hit, she does go fully under, waits a moment, and then bursts out to reveal that she is in fact just Scorpion S. Quelag. She has a long weapon that she lunges forward with, casts some homing magic from her staff, and attacks with her stingers. The fundamentals of the fight do work, but there's a couple problems across the board. First, her weapon attacks feel particularly weightless, and it's hard to tell what her attacks are doing when they blend into her body so well. The lack of weight and the strange delayed hitboxes from the spear make Najka's attacks unsatisfying to weave through. Second, the magic should theoretically be a nice shakeup to the Quelog formula, but none of her spells are interesting to dodge. They all force you to back off, but last longer than an AoE effect without giving you a window to punish. Quelog's magic combined with the lava trapping players to create dynamic attacks. Najka's magic lacks that. Third, the animation for the stingers is not great. They come out very fast and in pairs, so rolling through again feels underwhelming and discouraged. It's not too much of a problem, but it's just another of these small issues that keep Najka from reaching Quelog's level. On top of that, it's actually possible to run up her tails and stand on her back, which deactivates her AI entirely. Her most interesting move conceptually is when she dives under the sand. She tracks towards the player and leaps up without warning for some massive damage. To avoid the tracking, the player needs to stand on one of the stone slabs, which stops her from seeing where you're located. The only issue is then she takes a long time to burst out, and will usually still burst out close enough to deal damage to you. It's a neat idea, but it isn't well executed. 
Even with all these issues, there are enough cool fundamentals here that Najka does still earn a C grade. It's just frustrating to see a boss so inspired by a classic design fail to capture any of those things that really made that first boss stand out. I am so glad that the Royal Rat Authority is optional because if I was not recording footage, I would never fight it again in my life. This is my least favorite boss in the game. Considering my disdain for the other bosses at the bottom of my Dark Souls 2 ranking, that is a significant distinction. To begin, the Royal Rat Authority has the exact same issue as Capra Demon of all things, but manages to have the issue in a wide open arena. Now, how does it achieve that? These toxic rats. If they hit you once, you're inflicted with toxic. And they put four of them into the arena. They're small enough that some weapons can't even hit them with basic attacks. I was concerned my battle axe wouldn't be able to, and I was very glad to be proven wrong. Unlike Capra Demon, though, when you kill the small beasts, the fight arguably gets worse. The Royal Rat Authority is an absolute disaster in enemy design. First, it is ugly in a not fun way. Its tongue dangles out of its mouth with no real weight, and all of its attacks are half telegraphed and turn its entire body into a hitbox. The charge is boring, the claw swipes are boring, everything about it is boring and uninspired. It feels like a boss I'd expect to see in a Dark Souls student-made fan game, not in an actual FromSoft game. Like Sif, the game wants you underneath the Royal Rat Authority. Unlike Sif, the Authority's body is high off the ground, which means most weapons need to attack its legs, but you cannot lock onto the legs. Combined with its incessant hopping around, hitting the boss immediately becomes an irritation. Sif would also take steps while it turns to make it a little bit more natural looking, where the Royal Rat Authority must have some ice skates on because it just pivots like nobody's business. It looks bad, feels bad, and it is just an unpleasant fight from beginning to end. It is an F grade, and in my opinion, is the worst boss out of the first two games. And yes, that means I would rather fight the Bed of Chaos and Seath the Scaleless in conjunction than fight the Royal Rat Authority again. Sadly, leaving the Royal Rat Authority does not bring us to much brighter fields as we find ourselves face to face with a boss who did not earn his promotion. The Prowling Magus and Congregation aren't a bad fight, but they aren't a boss fight. Everything works as intended, the enemies are quick to burst down, the pews do serve as an interesting, destructible environment that can block ranged projectiles, and the Magus himself is painfully unaggressive, which leaves you alone to slaughter the congregation without any struggle. The issue here is that this isn't a boss fight. These are mobs with a shared health bar crammed into a small room. The room wouldn't feel out of place without a health bar or boss music. It's that simple. On top of that, this is, for some reason, a mandatory boss. There's not much to say because there's just nothing here to analyze. In my first playthrough of Dark Souls 2, with my first fight against the Prowling Magus and Congregation, my greatsword actually broke. In the middle of the fight, I had to open my completely unorganized inventory, select an unupgraded weapon that I had the stats for, and jump back in. I took no damage running around the arena, messing with my inventory and a boss should be able to damage you if you aren't looking at it, just as a general rule of these games in general. I do give this F grade with far less hatred than the Royal Rat Authority, but the Prowling Magus and Congregation are still an F grade boss. That said, they're probably like a C, maybe a B ranked mob room. They're pretty, it's a nice mob room. It's okay, it's pretty fun. Um, not a boss though. There's a lot to break down in the Duke Steer Freya. There are so many options for how you can take the fight on, and so many things you can do to change the rules and challenge of the fight, that it stands as one of the most flexible fights in the series. The Duke Steer Freya is a double-headed giant spider who attacks you with its brood. However, as you might have learned in the previous area, small spiders are afraid of fire, and will not attack if you have your torch drawn. Immediately, this creates my favorite boss environmental challenge in Dark Souls 2 and a contender for one of my favorites in the series. You have to choose between having both hands and dealing with an endless spawning cycle of spiders, or you sacrifice one hand and effectively remove the mobs from the fight. The spiders are easy enough to be simple to take down, but abundant enough to be a recurring issue, which means both paths are just as legitimate of a choice. That is one of the hardest lines to sit on, and Freya nails it. The Duke's Dear Freya only takes damage when you hit its head, with the twist that each side of the body has a head. 
I think the double head placement adds a lot of strategy and encourages mobility a lot more than other fights with only a small place you can hit. The heads have a hidden health bar before they fall off too, meaning you have to swap between the heads, and if the spiders are aggressive, running back and forth between the two heads lets you keep pressure on the boss while still dealing with a mob of enemies. Again, it all ends up creating this satisfying cohesive design. The one place that Freya does start to fall a little flat is her moveset. She can stab down with her frontish legs, she can do a bite that has enough delay that I'm surprised it didn't grandfather into Elden Ring, and she has a giant laser beam that is a perfect opportunity to get to her other head. Other than that, she sprays acid and jumps around, but overall, the movesets aren't really engaging in either direction. Swapping between the heads keeps the fight fun, but the limited moveset holds her back a lot. There's just not a lot of exciting moments in the fight. Like The Last Sinner, Freya also changes New Game Plus in an unusual way. Namely, she starts to attack you earlier in the level, and the damage dealt to her here persists to her fight. Though it's a neat and startling set piece, I wish we had seen this idea integrated in the base playthrough. Imagine if, as you travel through the entire area, Freya was a constant threat roaring at you from above, shooting lasers, climbing up cliffs without warning, spraying acid down at you, sending spiders into random mob fights. That feels like a great idea that got half implemented as a shakeup during New Game Plus. I love it, don't get me wrong, it's one of my favorite New Game Plus changes and I wish there was more like it in the series, but it leaves me wanting more than it leaves me satisfied. Despite that sentiment expanding to a lot of Freya, she does still earn a B for that great environment and interesting double head mechanic. With a couple more moves or some more level implementation, I feel she had the potential to be one of the best bosses in the series but a dull moveset sucks a lot of the replayability out of any fight. I don't know where to start with the Royal Rat Vanguard. Not only is there already a Royal Rat with the Covenant behind it, but this boss is one of the only bosses in the game with a non-hidden bonfire right next to the arena to make the run back as short as possible. Out of every boss in the game to give an enemy free bonfire run, why is it a bunch of rats? The Royal Rat Vanguard is a rat with a mohawk. Enter the room, kill normal rats, don't bonk off the statues, and then kill the rat with a mohawk when it shows up. It is easy to get overwhelmed, particularly with the petrification effect, but it doesn't feel difficult or exciting. The statues are the real boss here. Your attack bouncing off them is more threatening than anything this boss or its mobs does, just because of how wide open it leaves you. Honestly, the boss doesn't even attack, he just runs away. This fight is a bunch of rats chasing you, and that's it. It's another F grade, at least the Prowling Magus tried to pose a threat even if he was a miserable failure. Halfway through the boss roster and finishing up the Great Soul portion of the game, we have the Rotten. I've always enjoyed that climbing your way down to the gutter and Black Gulch doesn't have any other filler bosses. It gives the impression that the only thing that survives down here are things like this, a pile of enraged corpses trying to build shrines. It builds up tension and atmosphere for the fight in a way Dark Souls 2 often doesn't. In terms of moveset, the Rodden is another simple opponent. He slices, he chops, and he explodes. If your agility is not up to par, it quickly becomes one of the more infuriating bosses in the game, but if you have a proper role, which at this point you have enough of an opportunity to get that, moving through his attacks and whittling away at his health bar is pretty satisfying. His arena is also a really fun one. Though circular, large sections of his arena are lit on fire and spell a quick death. The Rotten attacks slowly enough and doesn't push forward, meaning it's almost entirely on the player to be aware of their spacing. It stops the restrictive arena from ever feeling unfair, while also making it a pretty significant threat. For such a passive hazard, it's surprisingly engaging. The Rotten earns a B grade. I do wish he had a few more moves or an escalation as the battle progressed. He's got a long enough health bar that it wouldn't be unwelcome, since the moves do start to grow stale as the fight starts to draw to a close. Years before, Elden Ring decided to create rematches of every single boss fight with a second enemy joining the fun, we had the Twin Dragon Riders. I make fun, but I've always found the dual Dragon Riders more entertaining than the single Dragon Rider. One of the Dragon Riders is identical to the first encounter, but the other leads with a bow and stands above the rest of the fight. You can bring it down by getting the ground-based Dragon Rider to attack the pedestal the archer is standing on, where you'll realize they didn't bother to give him a falling animation. He just falls feet first into the ground. Great work, Dark Souls 2. That said, it makes for a more entertaining fight. 
Do you fight two melee at once, with one being an obvious target with its lower health, or do you fight one melee with higher health and leave the ranged enemy for later? There's more happening here than with the first iteration that definitely makes the fight stand out, and with the Dragon Riders being as simple as they are, they don't fall into the same trap as enemies like the Rune Sentinels, who are very hard to effectively hit. With that said, the moveset is still uninspired, to put it lightly. I can't give them higher than a D grade, and as soon as one Dragon Rider is down, this fight just goes back to being the same boring boss as the first encounter. In preparation for this series, I watched a lot of people's opinions on Dark Souls 2's bosses, and I see Linking Glass in the top three for a lot of players, and I frankly don't understand why. I mean, don't get me wrong, Looking Glass Knight is an above average fight. The visuals in particular are some of the best in the game. This pale silver metal combined with the pouring rain and lightning attacks are visually astonishing, particularly in Dark Souls 2's color palette. It serves as a culmination of working your way through Dringle Castle in a great way. The move set is interesting to dodge, but moves a little too slow for my personal taste. You can start an attack, and you can squeeze another attack in before really needing to worry about the fence. I imagine this slow pace was to make the fight less overwhelming when, partway through the fight, he summons in an invader to fight alongside him. The Looking Glass Knight's AI doesn't change at all for this, which can quickly create two melee enemies charging after you, which as you've likely figured out, I've never been a fan of. I can only imagine how frustrating the fight would become with an actual player using strategy to work alongside the knight. Thankfully, the knight is static for a long while after the invader is summoned, giving you plenty of time to wail away on the NPC versions. I do think it's a neat concept, but it kills the fight's pace for me. Unlike the pyromancers in The Lost Sinner, these summons have larger health pools meaning not every build can rush them down. And considering how much the Looking Glass Knight wants you to roll into and through each of his attacks, it ends up hiding the boss's strengths more than enhancing it. I'm also not a big fan of his shield. He doesn't hold up the shield to block, it's just a mobile wall your weapon can bounce off of. I understand why they did it, but I don't really enjoy it. Overall, I think the Looking Glass Knight earns a B grade. He's a good fight, but I don't understand the glowing accolades he often receives. I don't think there's any boss in any Dark Souls game that makes me so violently and deeply uncomfortable as the Demon of Song. Part of me wants to say that makes it a good design, but I don't know what's happening here. Where do its arms go when it closes its head? Why does it have these tiny fins halfway down its body? It can't swim. Uh, where is it going to swim? And going back to the arms, why does it have fleshy arms instead of scaled front arms? We can damage monsters made of stone, so... What is that skin made of that makes it impenetrable? I'm just confused, guys. Help. In terms of gameplay, Demon of Song is a boring and often irritating fight. You can only damage the face when it's open, and when it closes it stops attacking, and so you just have to sit and wait for the demon to attack again. It's got slams, grabs, body slams, and that's it. Despite not much happening, the hitboxes always manage to feel bad throughout the fight, which I can't tell if that's disappointing or impressive. I think the big issue is the fight has no real pacing. It opens, has a neat initial impact, you dodge, you hit it, you stare at it, and then you repeat that until it dies. The uncanniness of the whole battle saves it from the top tier. <laughs> from the top tier? Oh god, no. The uncanniness of the whole battle saves it from the bottom tier, but the unmemorable score doesn't help push the fight forward, so it just gets a D grade. Also, Again, I'm confused because demons are supposed to be from the bed of chaos. Smelter demon, maybe I can see that, but how did we end up with a slug and a frog? Lore side of YouTube needs to give me some answers. I hope you enjoy Knights in Armor, because after the Pursuer, the Dragon Rider, the Old Dragon Slayer, the Ruined Sentinels, the Dragon Riders, and the Looking Class Knight, we've come to another Armored Knight in Dark Souls 2. Guarding the king, you come face to face with Velstat, the royal Aegis, armed with a bell that he uses as a hammer, which is kind of cool. Velstat has a great amount of care put into him, more than many of the other knights, and he definitely sticks out from the rest of the roster of bosses in the base game. His attacks come out at a decent pace, he moves in and out of the fight in a natural way without being quite as evasive as the Lost Sinner was, and he has a second phase damage buff where he deals more damage and takes less damage, which works okay. It is hard to really analyze Velstat's moveset, because it feels simple yet satisfying for a reason I can't put my finger on. 
The hammer swings are telegraphed, and he really does put his whole body into every attack. It sells the weight of the hammer more than a lot of the other bosses in Dark Souls 2 do. However, since the bell hammer rings to start the second phase, I'm a bit disappointed that the bell doesn't ring every time he smashes it against something. With ringing bells being one of the big themes of the Undead Crypt, it seems strange for the bell to not follow the same pattern. Falstat also has a great presence. Combined with the cutscene doing some nice setup, the deep brass armor combined with the weight of his attacks gives him a significance many other bosses in Dark Souls 2 lack. He feels important, and taking him down feels like an accomplishment. As I said, the opening cutscene helps a bit with that, and the shots are cool, but altogether it doesn't really do anything. It's just him standing up while looking cool, which, I mean, good on him for a nice drip, but he's just standing up, game. You don't have to make such a big deal out of it. I struggle a lot giving Velstat a grade, but I think he does earn an A grade, even with the simple moveset. It's satisfying enough to dodge through, and the buff adds enough of a feeling of progression that it creates more of an experience than most Dark Souls 2 bosses. It's a fun fight. Anyway, after that, we're back to bosses I hate, and starting this section off is the Guardian Dragon. The Guardian Dragon's answer to why would a dragon not just fly away is putting the dragon in a cage where it proceeds to fly around and blow obnoxious fire breath attacks, then land and attack with bites and stomps with horrid hitboxes. This is also a problem specific to Scholar of the First Sin, but there is a Guardian Dragon that does not fly in the Hyde's Tower of Flame in one of the potential first areas of the game. Considering how strange Aldia's keep is with the animated dragon bones, souls trapped in mirrors, giant enemies, and conga line of ogres, the boss just being a dragon that you saw before as one of the first enemies in the game is a massive disappointment. This boss could have been literally anything and it would work, and we just got a dull dragon. It's an F grade fight, I don't even know what to say about it. It's a boring fight against a disappointing enemy. Let's move on to another dragon. And, uh, also this dragon's even worse. Uh, the honor of the worst dragon in the game goes to the ancient dragon, who has two moves. He stomps, or he does a fire breath that one-shots most builds. For a boss with two moves, you think that that wouldn't last long, but this is one of the longest boss fights in the entire series, even with a good weapon. The arena is just open space, which makes it even stranger that the ancient dragon, who had no desire to actually fight you, never leaves. I don't understand why, after you tickle its toes, it makes the decision that it must fight to the death. On top of that, the Fire Breath, the second of the two moves that it has, is one of the worst moves in the entire game. There is only one direction to run when it breathes to reliably dodge it, towards the Ancient Dragon's tail. If that tail is off the edge of the map, you're shit out of luck. Getting the Ancient Dragon to move away from those edges verges on impossible, as he just stands there completely disinterested in anything but doing more fire breath attacks. I mentioned before that I'm trying not to rate bosses off the quality of the area, but after you beat the ancient dragon, every enemy from outside, of which there are a frankly unholy number, re-aggro to you, charge into the arena and attack. I had stopped the recording, but I didn't select the feather fast enough and just died. It's not hard to just code enemies not to aggro into an arena, but Dark Souls 2 just creates this insult for a dragon fight and then wants you to suffer even more inside the arena. Kalamit's animations may have been strange, with his bite attacks looking more like he was attacking with his nose, but the ancient dragon is so universally disinterested in fighting that it kills the entire vibe of the game. He gets an F grade and frankly should have been left on the cutting room floor. And approaching the end of the base game, we get a little bit of a rematch here. Turns out, The Last Giant didn't hate you for the drama of the cutscene. The Last Giant hated you because after learning King Vendrick was hollow, you were led to the Ancient Dragon to receive the Ashen Mist Heart, which allowed you to travel back in time to kill the Giant Lord, who was the last giant back when he was launching an attack on Vendrick's kingdom after Vendrick was persuaded by Nishandra, who's actually the main villain, to attack the Giant Lord's kingdom. The Giant Lord seemed to be doing great here, and then you had to bring time travel into the whole thing and kill him. I don't know what's going on in Dark Souls 2. <laughs> The Giant Lord shares most of his moveset with the last giant, but now he has a sword, and with this sword, he can attack you if you're standing on this ledge away from the actual fight. Other than that, he keeps slashing and stomping his feet. Much like when he tore off his own arm, the sword doesn't actually change the fight much, it 
just makes the encounter feel similar. The last giant was an early game boss, and his moves were pretty simple. The giant lord may deal more damage, but his moveset feels painfully basic for this point in the game. On top of that, though his outfit definitely helps tell the story of the time travel, it also doesn't play particularly well with the camera, making it easy to lose sight of what the boss is doing. He does, however, earn a unique distinguishment for his environment. I'm of the opinion that a boss run adds very little to an encounter, but the giant lord here is determined to prove me wrong. You have to charge through an active battlefield, avoiding a massive stone head to reveal the giant lord through the smoke who immediately brings his sword down. It's this cinematic, memorable moment that starts the fight out on a high that it does sadly never manage to reach again. Overall, Giant Lord also gets a D. It's hard to compare it with The Last Giant, but I do give the Giant Lord a bit of an edge, just because of that introduction. Dark Souls 2 seems to have this habit of putting my favorite bosses in the game behind atrocious areas. Smelter Demon requires the Iron Keep, and the Dark Lurker requires you use a humanity and kill every enemy in a dark, claustrophobic space of your choice in order to give it a single try. Even with that, I do still usually go out of my way for an encounter with the Dark Lurker, just because I enjoy the fight that much. The first thing to bring up is Dark Lurker's design. As the game's hidden boss encounter, Dark Lurker looks the part. It is a four-armed angel with no visible weapon who summons magic swords and these powerful dark magic spells. The attacks are varied, using color to telegraph what spell is being cast, and the colors stick out beautifully against the black and gray of the arena. He's got soul arrows, great sword slashes, a machine gun of dark energy, an explosive dark ball that travels through portals, fireballs through portals, a magical burst, and flies up into the air and does this huge cinematic laser. They're all tough to dodge around, but each attack has a long windup that keeps the fight from ever getting too fast paced. Then, at half health, he splits in two. This duo boss fight are also identical, but share their health bar, meaning every hit you can get in brings you closer to the end of the chaos, and there's no falling action to this fight. With only a single, very punishable melee attack, the Dark Lurker keeps their overlapping attacks to a minimum as they force you to find moments at the edge of their spells to get an attack in. You can position yourself under a laser to attack them as they return to the ground, stick close to one in hopes of triggering melee, there are a lot of options here that most duo fights in the series just don't have. Considering the almost universally agreed upon way to make a good gank fight in these games is two unique enemies that complement each other, the fact that one of the best gank bosses in the series is two exact duplicates is a testament to the Dark Lurker's enemy design. It was made to fight two at once, and for that it stands far above the rest of Dark Souls 2, and frankly, even some of Elden Ring. The camera is the most significant problem involved with the fight. With the portals involved, you can get crossed in and, while focusing on one attack, be ambushed from behind by another spell. It's a bit of an unavoidable fact that you're watching both Dark Lurkers and two different sets of portals to figure out what they're doing, when they're doing it, where it's going to happen, and what you should do to dodge it. It's not too frustrating, but it is the biggest problem of the fight. I think Dark Lurker earns a strong A grade. The balance between the first and second phase of this fight works beautifully, and the Dark Lurker easily wins the best moveset for a two-on-one fight in the series. I debated putting King Vendrick earlier in this list, when you find him the first time right after fighting Velstat, but finding the king right there would be an insane battle and doesn't feel like what the game wants to do. Before I go into any of King Vendrick's mechanics, I should mention music. I haven't mentioned any music so far because Dark Souls 2's more action-focused soundtrack has always been underwhelming to me. The songs feel even more samey than Dark Souls and its barrage of songs that begin with the letter A, and all the Dark Souls 2 songs really lack any impact. But where Dark Souls 2's soundtrack does knock it out of the part is their quiet, somber songs. Majula is, of course, an incredible piece, but King Vendrick's theme, which plays even before you engage with the boss, tells King Vendrick's entire story without a single word. This entire time you've been after the king, you pass the king's Aegis, only to find him naked and hollow, wandering in a circle for eternity. This is not a king. This is a corpse, animated by the same curse you will still succumb to. And that's just fucking cool. 
Vendrick has a sky high defense stat that's cut in half for each giant soul you acquire. Killing the ancient dragon, giant lord, and finding the other souls all build towards being able to finally face down Vendrick himself. Even with that, he has a ton of health, meaning you are in for a long fight. Like the ancient dragon, Vendrick doesn't have much of a moveset. Though he hits like a truck and his sword swings wide, Vendrick feels like a basic hollow with every stat maximized. This, of course, doesn't make for an exciting boss fight, but it makes for a memorable boss encounter. There's something tragic about this boss that you've spent the entire game searching for being nothing but a simple hollow with only echoes of a strength of what's had. It goes for a similar thing to Gwyn, but whereas Gwyn wanted to be a threat, the tough part of Vendrick is not the damage that he can deal, just the beating he can endure, and the beating he has endured. It's a unique spin that doesn't quite make for a fun fight, but it's really an interesting mechanic. Almost entirely off his atmosphere and concept, I'd give him a C grade. If this was a required boss, I don't think I'd be as kind to it, but putting Vendrick down is simple enough to avoid the frustration of things like the Ancient Dragon, yet weighty enough to feel like a worthwhile side quest. And with that, we are in the DLCs, which, when I was initially buying Dark Souls 2, I heard it was the pinnacle of Soulsborne content at the time. And following up one of the series' best ganks is... Oh... Oh, oh no, it's an F-grade fight. Oh, that's... The, oh, this is bad. This is... Th this is all bad. Why... Why did they make this fight? These are just NPCs. They, they, they aren't even new NPCs. This one's just Havel. He was in Dark Souls 1. Why is there an enemy that can petrify you in the, this corner of the arena? Who put that there? Why are the enemies not affected by the high water if they're just NPCs? They operate as bosses despite the fact that they operate by player rule. You can get parried in this fight. Why did they make the run to this boss so hard? None of this needed to be here. You could have just had two bosses in this DLC. I mean, people would have been sad just look at Ashes of Ariandel, but they wouldn't have had to fight these guys. I mean, hell, you can you can still cut them. Someone can go in and patch the game and seal up the door to the Cave of the Dead, and then no one will have to fight them ever again. FromSoft, employee, listen to me right now. The power is yours. You can do it. You can do it. You can delete the afflicted grave robbers. Do it now! Whew. Elena, however, sets the record straight being what is definitely the first boss in the DLC, and setting a new bar for boss quality in Dark Souls 2. She leads the roster by being a unique boss, taking risks by breaking most of the typical molds of bosses. Risks, I believe, pay off. Alana is a mage. Though she can attack with her staff, her primary moveset consists of delayed explosives and bullet hell type orbs of darkness that need to be rolled through. Combined with her higher health total than most mages, Alana has the ability to hold her own against even more aggressive builds. She attacks fast enough to keep up a threat, but not too fast to stop her from being easy to hit. The complication in this fight is introduced via her summons. She can either summon a group of pigs, a trio of poison skeletons, or Velstat. N not a mob, just the entire boss fight against Velstat. The pigs are frustrating to hit, but usually die pretty quickly. They're definitely the worst of them, though. The poison skeletons, on the other hand, are the easiest to handle. They group up, they stagger easily, and they don't do much damage. Velstat, though, is a fairly divisive mechanic. On one hand, he moves pretty slowly, and he doesn't do anything at range. He never buffs, so his damage never gets too absurd, but it makes the fight far more challenging than just three skeletons. It's difficult to get even a couple hits on the fairly capable mage when you have Velstat chasing after you with his bell. With that said, to call the fight RNG dependent is an understatement. Sometimes she won't summon once until the end of the fight, sometimes she won't stop summoning. There's not really a reason to even take out the Velstat summon because she'll just summon more by the time you're done. But taking out the other summons is pretty entertaining, mostly because Alana doesn't bull rush you while you target other enemies. It makes it much easier to track what's going on, and Velstat's slower attacks never catch you off guard, even with him around. Overall, I think Alana puts on a solid showing, starting the DLC off with a high B grade. The dependence on RNG can lead to some frustrating battles, and I've always hated pigs, but she's got a unique and well-executed concept. And to wrap up the first DLC, Dark Souls 2 decided to shake it up a little bit and include a dragon fight that isn't one of the worst dragons in the series. Great job, Dark Souls 2. I really appreciate the ingenuity here. 
Sin sticks out from the many bosses in the Dark Souls 2 roster, outside of the Royal Rats and the Ivory King, Sin is the only boss with no obstacles from their bonfire to the boss fight. It is a straight shot right into the jaws of this massive dragon. Sin also boasts another great boss introduction in Dark Souls 2. You encounter him a couple of times traveling the city, and as you reach his arena he rises and breathes poison fire in an arc above his head before charging at you. He's also got some solid character design with this massive spear that appears to be wedged into his chest, with flesh growing around it. Combined with his almost rotten looking skin texture, Sin feels sickly as he faces you, a design choice that helps Sin stick out particularly from the far more underwhelming dragon designs of Dark Souls 2. In terms of presentation, Sin does another real bang up job. The poison fire looks good and leaves a clear, easy to read effect for its lingering damage, which is something a lot of lingering damage effects don't do. The gameplay for this fight is far more varied than the Guardian or Ancient Dragon, as Sin has a far more mobile and diverse moveset. He charges, bites, slams, breathes fire down, and somehow most impressively, flies around constantly without ever becoming too obnoxious. He does these flying dive bombs, will shoot fireballs from above, spray poison directly down, or just reposition using his wings. There's a level of mobility in this fight no other dragon in the series has ever tried to reach. Sin can still fly, and this fight definitely walks that line where Sin both feels real and does not feel obnoxious. The fight, however, doesn't nail everything. Namely, Sin has a lot of camera issues. With his frame as thin as it is, lock-on can lead attacks to go completely under him, and certain breath or bite attacks have no visible tell from certain angles. The poison builds ridiculously fast, so one unfair hit means you're going to be wasting life gems to deal with that status condition. Though Sin's health bar feels the correct length for the fight, it does not play well with the weapon durability system. I have never gotten through a fight with Sin without my weapon running out of durability. Yes, you can use repair powder, but I don't understand why my weapons break on Sin, but not on the Ancient Dragon. Does he have some increased hardness when hitting him? And if that's the case, why give him that? I am of the opinion that weapons breaking as quickly as they do in Dark Souls 2 puts a huge damper on these longer endurance fights, and Sin is one of the fights that it suffers from the most. This playthrough, I did have an abundance of repair powder but needing to use one in order to keep using your weapon is a consumable use that is not engaging for the player, and it gives Sin an unnecessary layer of frustration. Overall, Sin earns a B grade. He represents Dark Souls 2 fairly well, but the struggles with camera and increased weapon break speed keep him from any higher accolades. Blue Smelter Demon is one of the most difficult bosses in Dark Souls 2 to rank for me. As I mentioned earlier, I adore the Smelter Demon. I think it's one of the best enemy designs in Dark Souls 2 by a wide margin, with the three phases interacting and building well together. The blue Smelter Demon is more of the same, so I enjoy it. In terms of changes, the blue Smelter Demon actually has occasionally delayed attack timings. This does a great job keeping the fight from being a full carbon copy, and the clear tells behind the Smelter Demon's attacks means the change timings never felt unfair to me. But past that, he's blue now, and so he does magic instead of fire damage. The arena is even the same, but made of rock instead of metal. The phase changes happen at the same time, the music is the same, and he even has the same horrible run to his arena. Although, and this may seem backwards, I feel more confident running through Blue Smelter Demon's area than the original Smelter Demon, but that might just be me. The fact FromSoft sold the DLC with a hidden boss who is just a repeat of a boss already accessible in the main game with just a couple delayed animation is remarkably lazy and bloats an already bloated boss roster further than it needs to be. So my question came down to this. Do I rate the Blue Smelter Demon badly for the fact that it is a cheap reselling of a good boss at a premium rate, or do I rate it highly for still being a fun fight because I like Smelter Demon that much? After a good amount of back and forth, I do have to rate the fight as a fight. I think it still earns a B grade. I just can't rate the actual mechanical fight badly. It's too much fun. And here we go to the infamous Sir Alon, who, again, I think is vastly overrated. Firstly, in terms of visual presentation, the arena is gorgeous. 
The sunlight streaming in and reflecting on the tiled floor creates an amazing atmosphere, and the detail of Alon committing seppuku if you manage to beat him without taking damage is great. I love those kinds of hidden rewards, and it characterizes Sir Alon in a way that most of the other bosses in Dark Souls 2 aren't. His music also deserves a shout out. It's such an intense song and fits the dramatic environment and blazing fast pace of the fight perfectly. It gives the fight a sense of weight, even without knowing who it is that you're fighting. Most of my issues with Elan come from his moveset and hitboxes. His hitboxes, particularly on his grab, feel less than stellar. His attacks linger for a moment, meaning there are specific directions that you need to dodge in order to actually avoid damage, which leads to some frustrating hits. He attacks fast enough that healing is also almost never safe, and damage taken unfairly feels even worse than it does to some of the slower paced bosses. On top of that, Surlon can get himself stuck doing the same move over and over again. If you know how to dodge and punish his dash attack, you're already over halfway towards winning the fight. He really likes using this move. He dashes and dashes and dashes and dashes. And when he jumps out of melee to stop you from punishing him, he almost always follows it up with another dash, which you can roll through the same way. With no second phase or evolution of the fight, Surlon feels simple. The battle seems to build towards this grand confrontation with an epic swordsman, and he really just likes this one move and the occasional slashes. It keeps him from reaching the greatness that the presentation tries to promise. Even with that harsh criticism, Alon does get a B grade. He's still an entertaining battle with an astounding presentation, though I think he's also emblematic of something that I have with Dark Souls 2 in general. Dark Souls 2, the bosses are very simple, and I think it's to a fault. It's hard to analyze a lot of the bosses because they only have a couple of moves and they are only interested in not telling a story through the boss design, but creating one moment and extending that moment out. There's so many bosses in the game, from the Giant Lord to Sin to Alon, that introduce this one grand moment that defines the fight, and then nothing really happens with it. Personally, I'm not a fan, but it creates this really unique atmosphere in the bosses of Dark Souls 2. Almost none of the bosses have a moveset that I can tell you what any of them do, but I can tell you every boss in Dark Souls 2 because that moment of introduction, for some reason, is secured in my brain, with, of course, a couple exceptions like Prowling Magus and Congregation. But there is such a distinct sense of character, despite all the characters feeling almost uncharacterized. It's a bizarre contradiction of boss design that I think Alon manages to manifest really well. Alon feels like a person, but at the same time, doesn't. He doesn't react, he doesn't move, he seems so static and so unnatural, but he still feels like someone, he feels like Sir Alon. It's bizarre. Meanwhile, Fume Knight manages to introduce a fantastic multi-phase night fight, fixing so many of my issues with the common night fight in Dark Souls 2. Fume Knight is introduced with an environmental gimmick. Around his arena are four ash idols that heal any enemies around them. If you don't destroy them, Fume Knight becomes a healing boss, still possible, but infinitely more difficult. And unlike Mytha, the way to stop the healing is made exceptionally clear from the get-go, which is much clearer, much better design. Once you get into the arena, you get another great boss introduction. As I mentioned, the DLCs do a really great job introducing each boss without a cutscene. Sin does his roar, the Fume Knight pulls himself from the ash, and we will get to the Ivory King. This provides a nice window to get in damage or buffs, and does a great job intimidating the player. In terms of moveset, Fume Knight starts with a longsword and his greatsword. There's a couple delayed moves, but all of them have clear tells. Fume Knight isn't as aggressive as Elan, and outside of a lunging sword thrust, his attacks have much longer wind-ups most of the time. The pace of the Fume Knight hits this perfect point where you never feel overwhelmed. It's a fair exchange with a massive knight. Once he hits half health, we get a phase change that bucks the usual trend of the series. Usually, when a boss in this series goes to the second phase, they move faster, hit harder, things like that. Although the Fume Knight certainly hits much harder, his moveset slows down to the point that it catches you off guard with how slowly paced his attacks come out. They gain magic after effects that punish players for keeping their distance, encouraging you to stay in range and learn the timings of his swings. He does have one AoE where he forces you to back up, releasing a bullet hell-like wave of fireballs to weave through, but this wants you to back up and then immediately press back in to counterattack. 
He has another attack that I've been waiting for a boss to have for ages. When you're behind him, instead of simply rotating towards you, he does a backswing in order to turn himself around. Now this seems like such a small thing in terms of animation, but it does a fantastic job keeping the player's focus on the moveset. All of his animations look, and more importantly, feel great. Unless you have low adaptation, but again, that's not Fume Knight's fault. Fume Knight earns a high A grade. Though he doesn't innovate, he is the definition of a tightly built fight and is definitely the best designed knight enemy in the game. He's riding just on the edge of the S grade for me, but his lack of innovation does make him feel out of place from that exclusive list. His tight animations, however, put him far above the roster of the rest of Dark Souls 2. The Fume Knight feels more alive than a lot of the rest of the game, just because he reacts so significantly to where you are standing. Like many of the DLC bosses in Dark Souls 2, Ava's most unique aspect is her presentation. Ava can be fought before even entering the area of the DLC, but with one massive caveat. She is completely invisible. Though she can be beaten in theory, this really affects level design more than boss design. You are completing the area not to reach the boss, but to make an attempt on the boss. It's a fun concept and really gives a feeling of circularity to the DLC's level. Once you have found the eye that allows you to see her, Ava's true form as a very big cat is revealed, and you're rewarded with a perfectly average fight. She has some jump attacks where the hitboxes aren't great, and she does paw swipes that spin her almost completely around instantly. She summons these homing soul masses and has an AoE, but other than that, she runs around the arena a lot, has enough health that some weapons will break at the end of the fight, which, as I mentioned with Sin, is not what I'd call great design. Ava isn't a bad boss. She's entertaining to fight, the snow tiger in a snowstorm is a fun aesthetic, but she just feels empty. She's fought on a thin bridge, but not thin enough to be an issue. She's mobile, but not quite mobile enough to be irritating. She does decent damage, but not enough to be terrifying. I think overall, she does earn a C grade. She does what she's supposed to do, but isn't an enemy to write home about. I mentioned earlier that I am not including areas as part of a boss fight's grade. I want to examine the boss's encounter independently. How well does it execute what it wants to do within the fog gate? For Lud and Zalin, however, it is impossible not to talk about the run. The area before these two is the single worst area in the entire Soulsborne series, and I do not say that lightly. Nothing comes close. It is a three minute long run with no sense of direction, filled with infinitely spawning versions of some of the most annoying, aggressive enemies in the game. And then to follow it up, the boss that you are rewarded with is not only a reskin of Ava, the boss fight fought immediately before it, but a boss fight against two Avas at the same time, with the boss gaining a move to heal itself and decrease the damage taken. I do not say this lightly, but this fight was a mistake. It tries to use the same principle as the Bell Gargoyles, where a boss arrives halfway through the fight, but unless you are specced for maximizing damage and the boss does not decide to hop away without warning, you end up fighting two at once with no change to their AI. They will both leap around the arena, their attacks will overlap constantly and consistently. Ava had a couple hitbox issues, but they weren't too egregious, and she'd jump away a couple times, but it was never too irritating. But when you combine that AI with a duo fight, Every time the game messes up, the consequence of not only doing the fight again grows from a short run and a single opponent to repeating an entire three minute run back to a boss fight that is dragged out to oblivion. Going into the one change to the moveset they made, once one of the cats goes down, the other one, for some inexplicable reason, now buffs itself. At this point, your weapon will have broken without repair powder, and so the boss starts to heal itself while also taking less damage. I don't understand why they decided to layer these effects. Maybe the heal is there to encourage you to rush down the boss, but when they take less damage, rushing them down is not an option for builds that aren't min-maxed. Though the buff eventually fades away, it is an aggravating decision, forcing almost every build to need to use the consumable repair powders after a three minute run to a duo reskin fight. It is an aggravating design decision, and I do not understand it. Lud and Zalin, even without the run to their arena, 
earn an F grade. If I was not getting footage of this playthrough, I would not have touched this boss, much less this area. If you include the run to the boss, they are the series' worst boss with flying colors. But they don't, so they won't be quite at the bottom of my Dark Souls 2 tier list. If you couldn't tell, I am not the biggest fan of boss fights in Dark Souls 2. My personal tastes lies more with cinematic boss encounters that focus through telling a story through an evolving battle, and that's just not what Dark Souls 2 is trying to provide. There are a couple small cinematics that I enjoyed, but all of them do pale in comparison to the Ivory King. Coming off of Lud and Zalin, where the runback took away from the fight, the Ivory King uses the runback to build towards the cinematic nature of the fight, similar to the Giant King, but much more effectively. After traversing the entire DLC a second time and recruiting three knights to aid you, the player leaps down into the old chaos, which is an incredible arena. It looks amazing, and the direct contrast from the cold blues and greys of the rest of the DLC create an incredible feeling of finality. At this point, three gateways around the arena begin to spawn in evil versions of your own knights. Pyromancers, a spear and a shield, and an axe wielder surrounds you, and you have to fight them as they spawn in. One by one, each of your knights will sacrifice themselves to close one of the gateways, stopping the spawning enemies. Frustratingly, they will sometimes just decide not to do this and allow enemies to spawn in once you reach the actual boss fight. It's a bit of an AI hiccup and can be pretty irritating, and I think that's also one of the reasons they had four knights for three gates. It gives a little bit of wiggle room at the start of the boss fight to eliminate the last enemies before the boss really starts in earnest. In terms of the boss itself, it is just another knight enemy, and it doesn't do quite as well as the Fume Knight did in terms of designing its moveset and animations. That's not to say it is a bad enemy. The Ivory King has a really solid mix of speeds and ranges he swings at, and his buff that grows the length of his sword to a ridiculous lightsaber length does a great job again forcing you into range with him. A lot of the successful knights in Dark Souls 2 focus on keeping the player interacting. Dark Souls 2 is a fairly simple game if you're able to utilize life gems and magic, and so this boss fight forcing you to interact, forcing you into proximity does a great job attacking the weaknesses of the player and increasing the challenge in a fun and interesting way. The Ivory King overall feels like a culmination of every basic enemy you fought to this point. His hitboxes all feel solid and it feels like a test of stamina management, roll timing, blocking, and landing punishes in a tense one-on-one -on -one battle. After the knight dies, it's possible that you can just get through the entire fight with it being a two-on-one. If the Allied Knights were a little bit better at their job of closing those portals, or the Ivory King's moveset had just a little more put into it, then they'd reach that S grade. But even with that knot, it still earns top honors in A grade, just from the sheer aesthetic and power and story of this boss fight. The Ivory King is my personal favorite boss in Dark Souls 2, because it's playing to what I want out of a boss fight, an evolving story. Returning to the final bosses of the base game, we go from one of Dark Souls 2's highs to a boss that I find emblematic of every single fundamental design issue in Dark Souls 2. The Throne Watcher and Defender. Throne Watcher and Defender is that boss fight that exists in every single Souls-like game that is not made by From Software that's trying to emulate Ornstein and Smo, but fundamentally misunderstands everything about that original pair that made them as successful as they were. The varied pace and damage amounts, the wide area with cover you could utilize, and the engaging choice when it comes to approaching their second phase are all completely ignored here. The Throne Watcher is acrobatic, using a shield and a rapier. Though she does have a slightly faster running speed than the Defender does, it's not enough to separate them, particularly considering the lack of any sort of cover in the game's final arena. The Throne Watcher had a light shield that would absorb a little damage, but the Throne Defender runs after you with his shield raised and enough endurance that breaking his stance is unrealistic. He barely feels like a boss enemy in this encounter. He's just combined with the Throne Watcher running after you, and as you try to find any moment to punish, it just vanishes as he turtles behind his shield. Once he reaches half health, he does start two-handing his weapon. Though this bumps up his damage, it actually makes the fight much easier, namely because you can reliably start balancing damage between the two. 
Which brings me to my biggest issue with this boss. When one dies, the other will cast a spell that brings the other back at full hit points. They can and will do this infinitely, meaning you have to balance their damage, attack both regularly, get them both into their buffed second phase, and then rush them down at the end. The general idea behind it isn't inherently bad, which is why we saw versions of it play out again later in the series, but it doesn't play well with their combined designs. In any gank fight, the player is immediately asking, what can I do to mitigate the advantage this boss has? In Ornstein and Smo, it was choosing one to target. It was utilizing the arena. There were options, there was flexibility. None of that exists in this fight. You just have to suffer through the gank fight until you reach the end. That's it. No flexibility, no maneuverability, no story. It is incredibly rigid. Throne Watcher and Defender receive another F grade. Considering there are already two other final bosses in this same room, these two feel like a vestige of an earlier draft of the game that frankly should have been cut. And finally, we reach the first final boss of Dark Souls 2. Unlike Dark Souls, Nashandra is not a contemplative or somber fight that pushes you to any sort of limit. Though it is still a thematic battle, Nishandra is explicitly the villain responsible for everything wrong in this kingdom, and her intent is to kill you for power. There's no end of an era happening here, there's none of that, this is a villain here to kill you. In terms of moveset, Nishandra is simple to almost a fault. She swings her scythe, has an AoE blast, and a laser beam with a less than great hitbox. The mechanic I enjoy, however, is that she summons three curse orbs. These orbs are broken once you hit them once, but if you're near them without breaking them, you immediately begin to hollow, lowering your max health rapidly. The notable thing here is the atmosphere this creates and how it ties into the overall story of Dark Souls 2, and that, for me, is what sets Nishandra apart. I have spent a lot of this video talking about things that I do not like in Dark Souls 2, but one thing that I think it improves on Dark Souls 2 is the framing and clarity of its story and primary theme. The opening cutscene does a phenomenal job setting the stakes of exactly what hollowing is, how personal hollowing is, how all living creatures, how you should fear going hollow. And though I don't enjoy the hollowing mechanic, it creates far more of an active threat than hollowing in Dark Souls, which previously just meant that you weren't allowed to summon Solaire. The entire story of Dark Souls 2 builds on this theme and fear of going hollow. Vendrick, the last giant, both are these powerful kings, almost gods, worn down to nothing by this curse. And this monster, the one responsible for their downfall, revels and spreads this curse like a rot. She seems to enjoy herself from the cutscene. She wants you and everything you know to hollow. She wants you to lose hope. She relishes in it. And all of that, I feel, does come through through the fight just through these hollowing orbs. Considering the entire playthrough of Dark Souls 2 is a loop of burning effigies over and over again, trying to find answers on how to stop the curse and being dragged into this grand fantasy conspiracy, the game culminating in someone wielding hollowing as a weapon is a great way to bring the story of Dark Souls 2 together. I wish we saw more of this kind of storytelling not just in Dark Souls 2, but in gaming in general. It's so often that a final boss is just defined by the numbers and move sets, rather than a thematic connection so directly to what the player is and what they are supposed to be fearing. Nishandra is Prepare to die. It is Prepare to Hollow. We see it in Lucatiel's quest. We see it in Vendrick. This entire game builds towards Nishandra, and Nishandra runs with it. Yes. Nishandra has an underwhelming move set, but I still admire what this fight accomplishes and what it means that the game as a whole accomplishes. It's one of the fight for me that makes Dark Souls 2 click into place, and even with my dislike of so many boss fights, so many mechanics within this game, still makes me say, it's a game worth playing. This is a hot take, but I think Nishandra is an A-grade boss, and if more of the base game followed in her footsteps in terms of thematic design, I'd be much more forgiving of Dark Souls 2's more mechanical shenanigans. However, I played Scholar of the First Sin, which means Nishandra is not our final boss this playthrough. Aldia decides to show up, making a third boss throwing down in the exact same room. 
And how does Aldia stack up with the very bad Throne Watcher and Defender and the more story-driven Nishandra? Well, Aldia is sure a boss, I guess. Aldia, like Nishandra, elects for the more atmospheric approach to the boss encounter. Unlike Nishandra, however, why Aldia attacks is more enigmatic. Aldia appears regularly throughout your journey, asking the player to ask questions about the true nature of their quest. When he arrives at the end of the game, he tries to get the player to think by lighting them on fire. There doesn't seem to be malice, and his mind is certainly present, so frankly I'm not sure why he's attacking or why this music is so sad. He even keeps talking after the fight, so I'm not even sure if we really kill him or if he can be killed in his current state. I end up leaving this fight with more questions than answers, and not in a great way. In terms of combat, Aldia is alright. He's another boss, much like the old Iron King, who I'd almost define as turn-based. Aldia is surrounded by an aura of highly damaging lava. You can't damage him because you can't move to him. Once he attacks, or after he teleports, the lava disappears, allowing you a few moments of offense to get some damage in. Some of his more dangerous attacks also drop the lava, allowing for some risky play, which is a design choice that does help keep the momentum up in what's usually a very slow-paced battle. Aldia's moveset, however, is sadly limited. He can shoot small fireballs, one massive fireball, make a wave of branches that track you, and that's really it. The fight ends up being a massive waiting game, and the player often finds themselves hit by lava for attacking too long. Overall, I'd give Aldia a lower-leaning C grade. He's not a bad boss, his atmosphere is alright, though a little confusing, his moveset is okay, though a little dull at times, he just doesn't stick out to me in any real way. And with that, Dark Souls 2's bosses are done. 41 bosses all ranked on screen. Dark Souls 2 is a strange game, and I again need to repeat that my dislike for this game lies a lot with the core mechanics, and that dislike likely harmed some of these bosses more than they may have deserved. Dark Souls 2 is going for a specific design aesthetic, one that doesn't quite line up with what I want out of these games. And that's perfectly fine, it just means that for me, the bosses feel like they're always missing something. Like they're missing that evolution, that animation, that really brings them to life. Next on my list, though, is many people's favorite game in the series, Bloodborne. Now, not only will I be going over all the bosses in Bloodborne, but I'm gonna do the Chalice Dungeons, because... <laughs> oh god. For now, let me know what boss you hate or love in Dark Souls 2 in the comments, and what for you makes Dark Souls 2 work or not work. Either way, I'll see all of you in Yarnum. Have an amazing day, and I'll see you soon. Fume Knight is not nearly as aggressive as Elan, and outside of a lunging sword thrust... Fume Knight is not nearly as aggressive as Elan, and outside of a lunging... Fume Knight is not as aggressive as a lawn, and outside of a lunging, th lunz lunging sword thrust. Fume Knight isn't as aggressive as a lawn, and outside of a lunging thord sword thrust. The Fume Knight isn't as aggressive as a lawn, and outside of a lunging sword thrust, his, his attacks. Why can I not speak? 